Amen. How are we doing this morning? I like that go tell it on the mountain because that's exactly what we ought to be doing. The gospel ought to be found on each and every one of our lips continually because of the great gift that our God has given us in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let me quickly, if I can, I want to personally thank the Silva family. Where are you? Oh, there you go. I knew you were there. I just kind of looked around. There's so many people in here. Uh, listen, thank y'all for coming down. Let's give them a hand for a light in our first Advent candle. The year of our Lord, 2024. Hey, Amen, family. We are going to, as the choir are making their way in, we are going to, over the next few weeks, I thought it uh, fitting that we would take a look at a Old Testament historical prophet, prophecy from the book of Isaiah. And so over the next several weeks, we will walk through Isaiah chapter number nine. And today we will look at the first two verses. So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn there. And as the choir are making their, were making their way in, how about we thank God for our choir and their efforts. <laughs> their efforts to usher in the Spirit of God and to brighten and lively our sweet savor of worship unto our great God. Isaiah chapter number 9. And as I said, we'll look at the first seven verses in their entirety throughout the next few weeks. But today I would like to focus on verses one and two. And when you have found it, Isaiah chapter number nine, verse one, I would invite you to stand for the reading of God's holy word. Amen. Isaiah chapter number nine. Beginning with verse number one. Are we there? I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. Here's how my Bible reads. But there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. That's enough. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Somebody said, Pastor, you stopping right there? Yeah, I'm stopping right there. You can do that when you got the microphone. Isaiah chapter number nine, verse one, a, but there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. I'd like to speak briefly this morning from this subject. God's baby announcement. God's baby announcement. Uh, can anybody tell me the backdrop of the photo that you have there on the screen this morning? If you know it, I would just ask that you would raise your hand and let Pastor know the backdrop. What's going on in this photo? What, where is this? Who are these people? Look, look very close and and hard and see if you can discern. I see one lady standing on a chair. That's not exactly safe. Anybody? Any takers? Family, this photo pictures babies being introduced to their relatives over the Berlin Wall. A man raised barrier separating East Berlin from West Berlin in 1960. I said that right. 1960, the mid 20th century. This is where we were. As a people. 
At the time this image was captured, the Berlin Wall was viewed as a symbol of the Cold War, representing the ideological divide between the Communist East and the Democratic West during Germany. It was known as the Iron Curtain. Yes, it was. It prevented East Germans from crossing over uh, to freedom in West Germany. This is the backdrop of these people's uh, baby announcement in this photo. What should have been a joyous time of, of celebration and fellowship between friends and families, thanks to this picture, is forever reduced by the historical reality of the Cold War. Can you just imagine that? Here in our text, God, too, makes his baby announcement. God makes his baby announcement amidst the perils of human history, particularly amongst his very people. Today, I will deal with the first two verses we will step along, move into Christmas. The first thing I see when I look at this text, and that's good news, because today we're going to have one point. Somebody said, Pastor, you usually keep us here for at least 30 minutes. Well, you get a bonus today. First thing I see when I look at this text is the reversal of proclamation. Say that with me. The reversal of proclamation. This time, I want you to say it like you mean it. The reversal of proclamation. You don't have to take pastor's words for it. It's right there in the first two verses. Look what the Bible says. Uh, but there will be no more gloom for her who is in anguish. In earlier times, he, God, treated the land of Zebulun, the land, in the land of Naphtali, with contempt. But Later on, he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea on the other side of the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. Uh, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. This is an interesting passage, is it not? The reversal of proclamation. Uh, North Oaks family, beloved, what this speaks to, this speaks to the coming light. Say that with me. The coming light. This text, Isaiah's prophecy concerning God's baby announcement, was written some 700 years prior to its fulfillment in Christ birth there in Bethlehem. The hope of chapter number nine, verse one, comes on the heels of judgment pronounced upon the people of God in chapter number eight, particularly Israel, Judah's northern brothers and sisters. North Oaks, Isaiah prophesies that God's baby would deliver a remnant of Israel from the pronouncement of judgment. Indeed, he would deliver them from the pronouncement of judgment to the promise of peace. You have to understand when you look at uh, chapter number nine, verse one, if you go back just a little bit, go back just a little bit to chapter number eight, verses 21 and 22, this is the pronouncement of judgment. It's right there. There they will pass through the land hard pressed and famished. And it will turn out that when they are hungry, they will be enraged and curse their king and their God as they face upward. That's hard language to read of the people of God. These are Israel, Judah's northern brothers and sisters in Israel. Look at verse 22. Then they will look to the earth and behold distress and darkness 
the gloom of anguish. And they will be driven away into darkness. Can you just imagine God's glorious people refusing to believe the word of God have gotten to the point where they curse the king and they have the gall to lift their heads to the heavens and curse the God of the universe. Say it ain't so. For could God's people have, have, have come to the point where they lifted their heads to the throne of God and cursed Yahweh. And what a pronouncement of judgment. Then they will look to the earth and behold distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish. And they will be driven away into darkness. Look at verse 1 8. But there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. This is God's baby announcement that, that, that his baby would deliver a remnant of Israel from the pronounced judgment in chapter number eight, verses 21 and 22, particularly to the promise of peace. Friend, God previously pronounced judgment on all mankind. For it is risen, for the wages of sin is death. But God has condescended to reverse his proclamation of death on all mankind. For God brought hope to all of humanity in the gift of baby Jesus for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen, somebody. Friend, Jesus made it plain. Anyone who looks to him will find him to be a perfect savior. Oh, he did. It was found on his lips in the book of John. Chapter number three, verse 14 and 15. Jesus proclaims as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up so that whoever believes will in him will have eternal life. But what is this deal with Moses and lifting the serpent? Uh, we know that when God delivered his his people from Egyptian bondage, and there they're wandering in the wilderness because of their disobedience. The Bible says that the people of God got to the point where they were fed up with God's prophet Moses. They had heard enough. They started to murmur against Moses. And God said, you know what? I've seen enough. God sent serpents into the camp of the people of God. And the Bible says that the snakes were poisonous and they began to bite the people of God. And the people of God began to die. And God called Moses, come here, Moses, Moses, pray, God, please have mercy on your people. Yes, these people are stiff necked, but they're your people. If these snakes kill these people out here, the Egyptians are going to say God was able to bring them out of Egypt, but he couldn't deliver them into the promised land. And Moses began to, to plead on the people's behalf and God relented. And he told Moses, I tell you what to do, Moses. I want you to go and I want you to fashion a serpent. Put it on a pole. And I want you to go uh, before my people and I want you to pronounce to them, lift the serpent in the air. And pronounce to my people that uh, whoever would look upon that serpent would be healed. Do you know what the connotation is? No doubt some of the people were so mad and they were so callous. They said, Moses, you come anywhere near my tent. We're going to go upside your head. Can't you just imagine? The Bible says that those who looked upon the serpent, they were healed. The inference is that some folks still died. It's an amazing thing. And here Jesus says, 
Just like Moses lifted the curse. I'm going to be lifted. I'm going to become a curse. The Bible says anything that hangs on a tree is a curse. Jesus said, I am going to hang on a tree and any man who looks and believes on me will receive eternal life. Ain't it funny that folks are still going to hell? And yet God sent his baby over 2000 years ago and people are still falling and slipping into hell. Now it don't sound so crazy that some of the folk didn't look at the serpent that Moses had, does it? No doubt God made it plain. Isaiah announces that God's baby would deliver a remnant of Israel from gloom to glory, not only from the pronouncement of judgment to the promise of peace, but from gloom to glory. Uh, Such a weighty prophecy begs the question, uh, 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 what exactly is this gloom facing the people of God? Well, I want you to go with me for a minute because I want to consider what was happening at the time of this Isaiah's prophecy. What was going on between the people of God, amongst the people of God, amongst the people of this world when God made his baby announcement through the prophet? Isaiah. I believe we'll get a picture of the gloom. And I'm glad you asked. According to scripture, the historically authentic situation facing Ahaz, son of Jotham, king of Judah. You got Ahaz, the king of Judah, who, by the way, he was evil. Ahaz was the king of Judah and he was wicked before the Lord. He did what was evil in the sight of God. In other words, he wasn't concerned about God or God's law. And yet he was the king of Judah. It involved uh, uh, Ahaz, son of Jotham, king of Judah. It involved Judah's geographically uh, northern neighbors, Pekah, the son of uh, Remaliah, king of Israel. Now, remember, the kingdom split after Solomon, Jeroboam, Rehoboam, Solomon, son of Rehoboam and Jeroboam went up north and divided and split the kingdom away, uh, 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 split God's people forever. Now, the northern kingdom at the time of this uh, prophecy, their king, Pekah, was in power. Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, often referred to as Ephraim. In the Bible, after the split, uh, the Bible is oftentimes will refer to the northern kingdom as the kingdom of Ephraim or just say Ephraim in general. Ephraim was that son of Joseph and it was just north of Judah. And so everybody from there on up, it will refer to him as Ephraim. So who do we have here at this time? We have uh, Ahaz, uh, the king of Judah. We have Pekah, the king of Israel, their northern brothers and sisters. And we have the pagan king, Grazim, king of Syria, whose capital was Damascus, often referred to as Aram. Now, here's the reality. God's people in Judah were facing a terrible situation. That is, Pekah, the king of Israel, the northern brothers and sisters, went and formed a coalition with the pagan king Razin over Syria, Damascus or Aram, and they went to Ahaz and they said, we want you to join us because we want to go and attack the great empire of Assyria. We want you to join us. Uh, But Ahaz was afraid. He was afraid to do that. He found himself between a rock and a hard place. Anybody ever been between a rock and a hard place? So what they did, the northern brothers and sisters in this coalition with Razin, king of Syria, they came up against Judah to wage war and they besieged Judah. So what did King Ahaz do? I'll tell you what he did. Instead of looking to the Lord God in his time of trouble. King Ahaz sends a a king's ransom to Assyria for help. I couldn't make it up. Uh, It's right there in second Kings chapter number 16, verses seven and eight. Listen to this. So Ahaz, king of Judah, So Ahaz sent messengers to Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, saying, listen to the words 
that the king of God's people says to some pagan. I am your servant. And your son. Come up and deliver me from the hand of the king of Aram and from the hand of the king of Israel. Who are rising up against me. Verse eight. Ahaz took silver and gold that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasure of the king's house and sent a present to the king of Assyria. Say it ain't so. Is that what we do as people of God when we're faced between a rock and a hard place and we're facing trouble on every side? Do we look to God or do we form some um, some unholy reliance with the world in order to deliver us? Unbelievable language. We are your servant and your son. Thus, it becomes abundantly clear, North Oaks, the divided peoples of God, both Israel and Judah, get this, have plunged themselves into darkness because they refuse to believe the word of God. Look at Second Kings chapter number 15, verse 29. Second Kings chapter number 15, verse 29. Here's what went on to happen. In the days of Pekah, king of Israel, remember, Israel's northern brothers and sisters. In the days of Pekah, king of Israel, Tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, came and captured Ijon, Abel, Beth, Maaka, and Jonoash, and Kadesh, and Hazor, and Gilead, and Galilee and the land of Naphtali and carried he carried them captive to Syria. Look at that second part of verse one in our text. But there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. Look at that second part of verse one. In earlier times, he, God, treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. There it was in 2 Kings chapter 15, verse 29. He allowed Assyria to come and carry them off into captivity. But later on, he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea on the other side of Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. And yet God announces, I will send my son so that where there was darkness, there will be light. No, folks, in the very place where the Assyrian destruction began, the glory of God's baby would shine. It's an amazing thing. Isaiah announces that God's baby would transfer, uh, would transfer the whole nation, Judah and Israel, from darkness to light. Look at verse 2. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. I thank God for his son. I thank God for baby Jesus. I thank you for the testament of the word of God. The Bible got something to say about this. Uh, let's look over in uh, Matthew chapter number four, verses 12 through 17. Matthew chapter number four, verses 12 through 17. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been taken into custody, he withdrew to where? He withdrew into Galilee and leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea. Y'all see that language in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. 
Do y'all see that? Is that in your Bible? And look at verse 14. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah, the prophet. And then we have a quotation in verse 15. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light. And those who were sitting in the land and shadow of death upon them, light dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What a beautiful thing. God announces that my baby will come and rescue and transfer you from darkness. All of my people from darkness to light. And in the very place where the Assyrian destruction began, Jesus comes in the book of Matthew to the very land, Galilee of the Gentiles. And how many know that when Jesus began his ministry, Capernaum was his headquarters up north in Galilee of the Gentiles. We serve a God, North Oak, that keeps his Word. There is a motif of light versus darkness, which is synonymous with good versus evil throughout the scriptures. And it is masterfully exegeted on the lips of Jesus before the closeted disciple Nicodemus in John chapter three. Look at what the Bible says there in John chapter three. Uh, Verses 17 through 21, talking about this light versus darkness. For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe in him has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. Look at verse 19. This is the judgment. That light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light uh, for the fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought for God. Listen. I thought about it. I said, what would be the good illustration, uh, the perfect illustration for this? I thought about how I used to live. I used to be found in the club on Saturday night. Whether I was in California, whether I was in Memphis, whether I was overseas in Japan. Do you know the same thing that every club I ever went to had in common? It was always dark in that place, Dave. They had the lights out. Y'all ain't going to help me preach today. (laughs) Do y'all hear what I said? It was always dark in that place. And the music was loud. It wasn't godly music. But it was always dark. And I couldn't figure out, why is it always dark in the club? How about because the deeds in the club are evil? I think I'm right about it. Somebody said, Pastor, hurry up and move on. Hurry up and move on. My club and days ain't that far behind me. Move on, move on. Just a few things concerning the freedom we have in the true light, that is Christ Jesus, and I'm in my seat. A few things. Number one, and if you haven't noticed yet, today's message is a little bit different. It's a little bit different because I'm crazy enough to believe if I'm just crazy enough to believe that there's a soul in this room that doesn't have it right with Christ. I'm crazy enough to believe that somebody in here doesn't have it right with Jesus Christ. And so I'm preaching to you. Let me get back. A few things. Number one, God sent his son, Jesus. His baby to rescue men and women from darkness. I like the way the Bible puts it in John 12, verse 46. Jesus says, I have come as light 
into the world so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. What does this mean? God announced his baby 700 years ago and Jesus shows up some 730 years later and says, guess what? I came as the true light. And if you would believe in me, you will no longer have to remain in darkness. That's good news. Let me tell you what that's like. Let me dumb it down. Anybody ever had their light bill not be paid and find themselves in the dark? Anybody ever had their light bill not paid? And can you imagine not being able to pay your light bill and you know they're going to turn them lights out and you got your kids in that house and you say, you know what, let me call and, and let me try to talk to them. Let me see if I can talk them in and keep my lights on. Let me see if I can uh, do an owl you and maybe that'll work. And you call the light man and you say, Mr. Light Man, I know I haven't paid you your money, but I want to ask you, will you keep my lights on today? And that light man saying, do you believe I'm the boss? You say, oh, yeah, I believe you're the boss. That's what I'm calling you. Well, if you believe, don't worry about it. Your lights will be on. You see how simple that is? We can dumb it down, and, 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 and I hope it helps you understand. God says, guess what? You're going to remain in darkness lest you believe on me. And you don't have to pay anything. You don't have to do an IOU. You ain't got to go down to the pawn shop and pawn your TV. Y'all ain't going to help me preach. It's an amazing thing. What does that mean? There is nothing that we can do in our natural sales and our human effort to make the payment. There's nothing we can do to make the payment. I can't live a certain way. I'm never going to go to the club no more. Won't cut it. I'm going to treat everybody that I see. I'm going to treat them good. I'm, I'm not going to do no more bad stuff. I'm going to spend the rest of my days doing good. And you still miss the mark. I tell you, it's so quiet in here. I heard the floor creaking. God sent his son Jesus to rescue men and women from darkness. Number two, men stumble in darkness, but are able to walk upright in the light. Now, I'm probably going to get in trouble when I say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Karina told me several months ago, she said, I'm going to go put Gabriel Jr. to bed. Gabriel Jr.'s room is in the upstairs of my house on the front side of the house. Me and Karina's room is downstairs on the back side of the house. And I'm laying in the room. Karina gets up and takes Gabriel Jr. upstairs. I don't know, about 10 minutes later, I just heard a loud bang, boom, boom, clack, 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 clack. I jumped up and I grabbed something. Oh, yeah, I did. I said, somebody trying to break in my house. Sound like somebody's car ran into my house or something. I grabbed something and I, and I came to investigate. And there was Karina laying at the bottom of the stairs. I said, babe, what in the world? She said, I was trying to come down the stairs in the dark because I didn't want Junior to see the light and wake up. I said, girl, you almost broke your neck. <laughs> Is it not true that men stumble in the dark? I'm not trying to throw my wife under the bus. I'm just using this as an illustration. We do the same thing. Men today are stumbling. If you don't believe it, cut the TV on. Get on social media. Folk are stumbling all over the place. I'm leaving the country. Let me tell you something. My mind couldn't help but recall Paul's soteriological argument laid forth in Ephesians chapter number two. Let me read the first three verses of Ephesians chapter number two. We're covering in Bible study right now. Listen to what Paul says. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins 
in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God's baby, Martha, causes us to walk differently. Uh, Paul goes on to hit in Ephesians 5 and 8, a few chapters later, he says, For you were formerly in darkness, but now you are lights in the Lord. Walk as children of light. I don't know about y'all, but that lets me know that I don't have to worry about keeping myself saved. I don't have to worry about losing my salvation. I don't worry, have to worry about that I need to do this or I need to do that. God has spoken over my life and said, you are the light of the Lord. Do y'all hear that language? If you're in a room and, and you don't have it right with Jesus Christ, today is your day. Pastor usually have four points. I got one point. Get to know him. Come to the light. It's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. God sent his son Jesus to rescue men from darkness. Men stumble in darkness, but are able to walk upright in the light. Thirdly, if we profess to be in the light, and yet we hate our brother or sister, we are deceived. And so I was thinking, I said, how do I want to end this? Do I want to end on a high note? Or do I want to do a callback? Pull that picture back up for me upstairs. Pull that picture back up. I think I'm going to do a callback. What that says is, if you profess to be in the light and you hate your brother or sister, This is the kind of world you live in. The staunch reality of the bondage of sin. The staunch reality of refusing to believe the word of God. Family, I want you to take a good close look at that picture. I already told you one lady standing in a kitchen chair there. All she wants to do is to be able to catch a glimpse or maybe a smile, maybe a jump, a leap from the other side. How many know what happened when they got done taking this photo? Can I break it down for you? The lady standing in the chair. She got down and went back home on the same side of the arm fence. Uh, the, 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 the man that's holding the little boy look like, maybe, I don't know, maybe they're twins. When his arms got tired, he brought his baby down. He went home. I know that lady couldn't have held that baby up for long like that. After the photo, she dropped the baby and she went home. And whoever that is taking a, uh, what do you call it, photo bomb there in the middle? She went home in bondage. And what, what are you trying to say, Pastor? Today. Today can be different. Kelly, come on up. Today can be different. Let, let, let me tell you, let me tell you like this. Today, the wall of sin in your life that separates you from the one true and living God who made his baby announcement can be crushed. Maybe I'm the only one excited. The Bible says 
that the angels in heaven rejoice when one soul is saved. I just gave y'all good news. Jesus announced his baby and said, if you believe on my son, that wall that separates, that barrier of sin, it'll fall. You don't have to leave here on one side of the wall with Jesus on the other side. Every head bowed, every eyes closed. Charles, wherever you are, let me have some music. Lord Jesus, we as your people are crazy enough to believe We don't need to leave this place hating our brother and sister. Uh, somebody has no doubt laid siege to their brother and sister in this room. And today, the ramp can come down. Uh, there are relationships in this room that are broken and have been broken for years by barriers of sin that we put up. Today, they can come down. There is a barrier in the life of every man, woman, boy and girl that's born into this world that keeps us apart from God, separates us from the only one who can save us. Today, that barrier can be broken down. Father God, we're crazy enough to believe that you will move in this place right now. That you would bring your spirit in this place right now and that it would invade the heart of stone of some young man or some young lady and raise them to spiritual life. It will give them the knowledge that, whoa, I'm a sinner and I can't save myself. Jesus, come into my heart. Do for me what I could never do for myself. Today is a good day because pastor didn't preach long. I, I think I can come forward. Have your way in this place right now, Father God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.